Hey, so our speaker tonight is Travis Ripley. He's the Executive Director of uh, Fish and Wildlife Stewardship Branch of Alberta Environment and Parks. And he's got a special guest with him as well. Craig Johnson is the Regional Director for the South. Uh, Craig will be probably in the background tonight, but uh, not providing backup for Travis. Uh, Travis is, uh, he's the Executive Director, but uh, had a little bit of uh, background reading and uh, he has an environmental background as well. He's got a, an MSc in uh, environmental biology and ecology. And his thesis was on bull trout in the Kakwa River watershed. So he's, uh, he's got a bit of uh, fisheries knowledge behind him. Uh, he's also the minister's, reps on the, on the minister's rep on the Alberta Conservation Association Board of Directors. He's gonna be talking to us tonight a little bit about uh, fisheries management update and uh, a focus on uh, on trout. So Travis, I'll, I'll turn it over and uh, you can uh, share your presentation. Outstanding, thank you, thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet all of you. And I, uh, I wanna extend my thanks, uh, of course, for <clears throat> being here tonight. Uh, I just want to uh, quickly acknowledge um, how saddened I know I am personally, and maybe many of you are, as well as I know the government of Alberta um, hearing the news of the uh, 169 unmarked graves that may be found up at the residential school in Gruard. It was a pretty tragic uh, announcement that we received yesterday. So I just wanted to acknowledge that a bit today before I get started. <clears throat> but as, as you said, my background is fisheries and I'm happy to always talk about fisheries. I've been with the Department of Fish and Wildlife in its many forms for over 25 years now. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed all of those and I've learned a lot uh, along my way and my career path. And I look forward to hearing from you guys tonight. <clears throat> the, the presentation I have is one uh, that smatters of sort of a provincial perspective of fish and wildlife, uh, well, fisheries. But I did want to emphasize that it also uh, has that focus on trout as mentioned, because I think that that's something important to, to this group. So I'll just uh, start my presentation here by sharing my screen. And if I can get confirmation perhaps when my screen is shared and I can get going into my presentation, that would be helpful. Yep, looks good, thank you. Great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I wanted to start off by talking about some broad scale fish management programs and projects that we're operating here across the province or have initiated uh, in the province. The first one is gonna be uh, fairly familiar to you as, as you are a, a key partner in the delivery of our native trout recovery program. Along with many other partners, um, we have been focusing on a lot of great work uh, that's been happening along the eastern slopes, focused on West Slope cutthroats, bull trout, and Athabasca rainbows. And I, I do want to acknowledge the significant funding that we received from Department of Fisheries and Oceans to help support a lot of this collaboration. I think the key, the key part to this program, though, is collaboration. Uh, we really recognize that uh, partnerships are integral in order for the fish and wildlife community to thrive and really do good work on the landscape, whether it's you know, conservation of fish or promoting uh, different types of fisheries. I think it's important that we have uh, partners like Trout Unlimited and others uh, at our back and on our, at our sides. So just uh, a quick point on this. I think it's nothing new to all of you. We really focus on the three H's with this program focusing uh, specifically on habitat, whether that's restoration of any degradation or some of the destruction or fragmentation of habitats that's been occurring. I know we've gone on some recent field trips with cows and fish and others who have really been focusing on cleaning up some of those crossings and making them more trout inhabitable, which has just been fantastic. Uh, of course, you know, a key part of our program is also on the harvest, whether that's the indirect mortality resulting from uh, fishing, even if it's catch and release, or you know what we never like to see out there is any of the, the poaching or illegal harvest. And the third component is of course a hybridization with uh, some of the non-native fish like rainbows and um, rainbows and West Slope cutthroat trout. 
in the end though, it's a real compre it's a comprehensive program really looking at aiming to conserve the native trout and our cold water fisheries all along the eastern slopes. And just a, a quick shout out and a thank you to Trout Unlimited for being a partner with us uh, in that endeavor. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is just something that we embarked on last year. We meant to do it back in 2020, but we were delayed due to the COVID, the COVID pandemic. But we did finally get out our walleye collection program where we were focusing on collecting walleye eggs and stocking uh, walleye into a, a, I would call it a put, uh, put grow and take type fisheries. The intent here isn't just for restorative stocking of walleye into some of our water bodies, lakes and rivers, where we would like to see the walleye uh, get back to uh, good population levels and being in a self-reproductive state. This in fact is a program where we're focusing on multiple year walleye collection programming so that we can start to stock the fish into water bodies as a uh, option for walleye anglers who are very interested in this program. The first walleye spawn camp uh, that was held last spring resulted in stocking uh, millions of walleye, fry, and fingerlings out into 10 uh, southern Alberta water bodies. And that, and like I say, that program is going to continue on uh, as we go. I just want to put a little bit of a shout out to the Bow River. Um, I know many of you fish it. I used to be the biologist in my earlier career in Calgary as the Bow River biologist, and it was an important river for me, uh, but also for many anglers. It's gone through a ton of research and monitoring. As you can see from this slide, it, it, you know, and it's dating back to 1999, uh, you can see how much we've done uh, population estimates of the trout fishery there, angler, uh, angler surveys, like we call them creel surveys that have been scattered throughout that time period large river surveys where we're, where we're looking at even larger parts of the Bow River. And then some of the sport fishing regulation changes. Of course, 2016, we faced the concern of whirling disease in the upper bow in Banff that was uh, on our minds in the government. And I'm sure it's on all of yours. And then of course, some of the flooding events. So you could just tell that the Bow River is a heavily managed, as you would expect it to be, a heavily managed fishery. And recently, one of the discussions that we're having amongst others is really looking at the cumulative effects assessment program uh, as, it, as, it as it implicates the trout in this river. And this program is really about understanding, pop, you know, what are the factors around population declines and the stressors or the threats to the, to the populations, whether it's from, from anglers or from other, other uh, inputs or flows I think this is this is part of a real exploratory program that we're that we're really looking towards uh, completing in the near future. And again, we're not doing this alone. In fact, we have some good cooperation and partnerships with the Calgary River Users Alliance and other stakeholder groups and the guides to really complete uh, a really good uh, cumulative effects assessment and anticipate, uh, you know, based on those results, anticipate what might be the threats. And then of course, how we might want to manage the threats. And there's gonna be certain threats that are in the control and, and sphere of uh, my department, my branch. Uh, and that's gonna be those that we can control on the fishery. But again, there's gonna be perhaps some additional threats that are really outside my direct control or the branch's direct control. It might be some of my colleagues in other branches, whether it's water, water policy, land use or whatever. And we'll make sure that we evaluate some of the potential management actions that may address some of those threats as well to influence the outcome of the fishery. So that's some pretty exciting work. Can you I can interrupt the question here? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the several kind of regulated flows. There are, there are multiple dams upstream of the kind of most popular fishing part of the bow. Is that you know, is that part of the part of the conversation in terms of ensuring some kind of a more regular flow in the river or anyway, assessing the impact of those of those dams on on the river? So, uh, so I, I think the question is a good one. Uh, I might defer to Craig uh, 
Johnson. I, I should have introduced Craig. He's actually the director in the South. And I was going to mention that I'll take all the soft, easy questions and I'll throw all the, the hard ones to Craig. But, but just in, in, uh, in advance of Craig responding, certainly flows and the, and the changes and the dynamics in the flows and the trans alta um, influence on the river is certainly something that's on, you know, it's on our agenda. It might not be part of our responsibility in the Fish and Wildlife Stewardship Branch, but it, it, is, the, it is the department's responsibility in certain regards. And we're in constant communication with those folks as well in terms of what might be accomplished. I'm not about to say that we're going to change the flows or be able to alter those, but we'll certainly work in partnership with our colleagues to see if there is options that we can consider. But uh, if that wasn't a good enough answer, maybe I'll let Craig uh, highlight anything I might have missed. Yeah, the, the, the reason I'm asking the question is that I, I think I asked at some point, I asked somebody about the uh, the Kananaskis River, right, which is a... Uh, yeah a tributary to the bow in that kind of mid upper section and the answer i got back was ah oh, well you know the water levels fluctuate there so much you may as well forget about it uh either there's no fish or it's too dangerous to to get close to the water and so that's a bit of an extreme type scenario uh but that's kind of where where my question sort of originates from Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And I'm aware of the flow, the, the flows in the Kananaskis for sure, and how much they fluctuate. I don't know, Craig. Is there is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, for sure. Um, can you hear me? Okay, Travis. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so, the Kananaskis River, the the Bow River discussion, certainly, the Kananaskis fits into the uh, Bow River basin, but isn't part the the details around the Kananaskis aren't part of the, the cumulative effects work that Travis is speaking of. It's really focused on that piece of river downstream from uh, Bear's Paw through the city to the Cars Land um, <clears throat> Weir. Um, so on, on the flows piece, we are considering this as part of the cumulative effects assessment. And, and really, we've got our experts, our in-stream flow needs experts looking at what what flow level fluctuations affect fish populations and the aquatic environment and uh, it's certainly part of the part of the consideration of things that we're we are tackling and uh, um, working on one of the things that's really important for us to, to to disentangle is you know when we see these flows fluctuate and it's been a it's been a real hot topic i think on the bow river in the last in the last few years and we're we're really trying to lean in and understand how those flows are affecting uh, the aquatic environment, like I mentioned, or fishing. And sometimes they're not exactly the same thing. So it's certainly a consideration. It's part of this discussion. Um, we are in discussion with our water policy folks. They, they are part of this group. And, and even with Transalta, there's, there's ongoing discussions to talk about how, uh, how those flows are managed relative to the, those other interests like fish and fishing. So. It is, it is certainly part of this, this process. And, and from a, a conversation with the users, but also the hard science behind how those flows are, or may or may not be affecting fish populations. So it is a, it is a detailed part of the stressors that we're using. Thanks, Craig. That was a great question. Hope, I hope that was answered. I hope that was answered. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I, I understand your, it's, it's on the radar and it's a complex issue and mm -hmm. but as long as it's on the radar there's always hope that progress will occur slowly but <laughs> before the fish all disappear great thanks take out the dam take out the dam um okay i want to flip to the bull trout management plan um we engaged recently on the updated plan for this species. As you know, we've done the West Slope Cutthroat Plan. We've done the Athabasca Rainbow Plan. This is uh, our opportunity to update the bull trout recovery plan. I, I wanted to highlight this plan of all of the plans because of the, uh, the inclusion of a number of new elements that we've introduced into this plan. And it was, uh, I know many of you have, have read it and maybe even commented on it. As you can see, we had a tremendous response 
uh, for us, normally we send out a recovery plan and we'll get anywhere between four and 20 people responding, but we had uh, 400 on this plan. I should mention the other grizzly, the other plan we had a lot of comments on is the grizzly bear one. But this one included a lot of new elements around the habitat modeling, the fish sustainability index, how we were structuring our hydrological unit codes and really defining our watersheds. It was it was a really good plan and it was very comprehensive. And uh, for me personally, I was certainly impressed at how engaged the respondents uh, who have read the plan appeared to be, particularly with their comments and the overwhelming strong interest in making sure that there was the conservation of native trout and, and bull trout in particular. This plan was, was tabled just recently at the Endangered Species Conservation Committee and it is going for finalization and endorsement. And we will be publishing a what we heard document based on the feedback we received on this plan. So just a shout out to you uh, for taking the time uh, for, for those of you who did to provide feed, feedback and input into this plan. I think it made it, it made it really good. And the last slide uh, before the end of this section, and maybe we could break for some questions too, is just to highlight some of the work that we're doing uh, internal um, as well as, uh, as more external and around the sport fish regulations. I will highlight, and I think many, I think many know this, but I'm not sure who does. Uh, we have two uh, sort of overarching acts that govern the fisheries in the, in the province. One is our Provincial Fisheries Alberta Act, and that has underneath it two uh, regulations. One is the fisheries ministerial regulations, which are the regulations that uh, can be changed upon a ministerial order from the, from the current minister. And we also have the general fisheries Alberta regulation. And the GFAR is one that uh, is, is typically done through some other type of process, like a, it needs the approval of the lieutenant governor and council and debates at cabinet. And we're taking that regulation through uh, the process right now to talk about, you know, some of the changes we want to make about special fishing licenses. Uh, certainly, we want to make some improvements to the changes we made last year on uh, ice fishing shelters. And then um, we're introducing uh, uh, an option for veterans sport fishing licenses. And then, of, of course, anytime we open up a regulation of this sort, we're also looking at uh, the options of repealing or introducing any specified penalties that may um, uh, that may be associated with any changes to the regulations provincially. And in, a, in conjunction with this, uh, something you may be interested in is we are looking at also um, exploring and getting advice on conditions and terms for guides operating in Alberta and how that might look into the future. There's no immediate changes to the guiding uh, industry for fishing in Alberta at this moment, but we certainly are starting that conversation and, and beginning that work uh, this year. Now, the other act is the Fisheries Act of Canada, and underneath the Fisheries Act of Canada, there's the Alberta Fisheries Regulations. It may sound provincial, but actually it's a federal regulation, and we modify that federal regulation through uh, a variation order that adjusts the opening and closing, the catch limits, um, all of those sorts of things that you would see normally in the guide to sport fishing. And of course, we uh, I'll get to some slides later in the conversation, but we are looking at uh, adjusting some of the special harvest licenses for walleye. We're exploring a, the possibility of an e-tagging program uh, for walleye. Again, that's the only fish that you would need a tag for. Certainly having uh, conversations on sustainable harvest opportunities and one of the main focuses has been on uh, Lesser Slave Lake and the walleye and pike program up there, as well as uh, phasing out the class C category of walleye tags. So not so much trout related, although there's gonna be some trout changes coming this year, but uh, certainly uh, walleye and pike type related uh, conversations have been, have been happening quite frequently. So before I get into some specific, specific water updates, maybe I'll pause there and see if there's any other questions from the, from the group. Um, I, I, I will have another question unless somebody else, I don't want to hog the microphone. I'll wait my so, turn. Um, so I, I have 
two questions that I don't know if this is the right time or to wait for the specific waters portion of your presentation, but one I guess is a bit more general. I've noticed that in in a lot of water bodies, there are very generous take limits for um, Rocky Mountain whitefish. And simultaneously, I think there is a general sense of decline in Rocky Mountain whitefish across the province. I mean, this is all anecdotal. I don't have any kind of hard data to back this up with. But is there any sort of consideration for this somewhat neglected fish? Because my feeling is that this has been kind of historically a fish that was somewhat low on the totem pole, so to speak. And that kind of just got carried around and it it's now I've noticed, for example, on the Crow's Nest River that for the last two or three years, it's all catch and release, including the Rockies. And again, I don't know, this is purely anecdotal, but my sense was that I'm catching more whitefish than I have before. And I don't think I'm getting better at it. I just think there's more fish in that water. Uh, and I suspect it has something to do with uh, with regulation. And my second question is also kind of uh, is more specific, so maybe I should bring it up later. Is specifically about the water below the red deer, which used to be a pretty decent whitefish fishery, and it's always closed in the spring for reasons that are, I guess, because of the presence of pike and walleye. Um, but that would make a very nice spring fishery before runoff and you know, high murky waters, if it were to be restricted to something like, you know, you can only fish dry flies and nymphs kind of thing and keep your streamers out of the water. Um, I, I wonder if that's something that's somehow feasible within the existing frameworks or even considered anywhere. Um, this is just a curiosity question. Great. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, we could probably address them here because I know I don't have any specific uh, red deer water slides coming up. And uh, again, I'm thankful that Craig's on the call with me. In terms of Rocky Mountain whitefish, uh, I hear you. We don't normally um, tend to focus on our public engagements on Rocky Mountain whitefish. Uh, we, uh, we, we expect and, um, and hear from anglers that they want to talk more about trout particularly in some of those streams like the Crow and uh, the Highwood and others. So your observations of Rockies are a good one. I know that when the staff do the survey, and of course, Craig can speak to this in more detail than I, uh, as, uh, as the director in the South region, the staff do, uh, they, we're not just focused on the trout, on like um, rainbows or cutthroats or bulls, but we're also focused on uh, the Rocky Mountain whitefish population. And when they submit their regulation changes, which are done annually. Uh, I get a copy of those regu regulation changes. And the expectation that I have is that if there's a change to the Rocky Mountain whitefish populations, those will be reflected in, um, in, the, regulate, in the regulations that come forward to me. So I'm just saying that uh, the, the Rocky Mountain, I'm sure, and Craig can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm sure the Rocky Mountain whitefish are uh, looked at at the same time that we might be doing surveys on trout because it's, we're looking at the full river uh, fishery, not just specific species. And then they're making any sort of changes to those regulations on an annual basis. Um, I haven't had as much success as you fishing the Crow's Nest River for Rocky Mountain Whitefish. I used to catch them uh, more back uh, in the early 2000s than I do now. So, um, but again, I don't fish it as much as I used to, but that's a, but that's a good observation and one that I'd like to just uh, note down here. I'm glad this is being recorded. Yeah, um, no, this is, this is a, this is just only recent success and it somehow happened after the new regs of strictly catch and release came in. And that's, that's the reason I brought it up. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, I guess what you're suggesting or what you're noting is that the, the catch and release regulations having a profound impact on the Rocky Mountain whitefish because you're catching. They might. Them. I just, I, I really don't, like I say, I don't, I don't go electro fishing and, and counting fish properly or anything like that. But 
um, at the same time, when I see a lot of places, you know, you can take five whitefish home any size, no restrictions, it kind of brings my eyebrows up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's certainly something I can take back to the team. And I know Craig's heard it here today too, about ensuring we're having a, an eye on the, on the Rocky Mountain whitefish. On, on the red deer, um, I don't have specific details of the, the, the tailwater fishery that you spoke of. But I will say uh, when it came to your comment about, you know, dry flies or nymphs, but not streamers, we don't get down to that technical level in our regulations to afford those subtleties in uh, requirements. It's typically uh, less prescriptive than that and more general. So we might put on a bait ban or we might, um, yeah, generally a bait ban. Like we don't even right now have a, a fly fishing only regulation, I, I think. No. at least that I'm not aware of. Um, no. So so that type of specificity is hard to get at right now. It might be something we consider in the future. I know we continue to get ideas from anglers about you know things we can do, particularly on the red deer. Uh, but Craig, do you wanna pick up on that more specific comment or question on the red deer? Uh, I don't know the red deer uh, situation as well as I do the crow's nest, ironically. Um, but it's something we could certainly look into. Like Travis said, we don't have the, the, the tools in our box to, to put in a specific regulation about dry fly or those really gear specific regulations. But we are always looking for places where there's maybe um, additional opportunities that can be done safely in different times of year. So, you know, I suspect you're right with the constraints of, you know, spring spawning species like pike or walleye being present, but that's something we can certainly look into with the team um, to see to see what could be done there. So yeah, we'll I this. wonder if yeah, um, just to, to maybe follow up on this because earlier I think Travis mentioned that this is everything you do is kind of under the Federal Fisheries Act, and I suppose that for example, what happens in let's say Jasper National Park is done within the same framework. Um, it. I'm just speculating here, I'm not sure, but then if provincial rules, and they, I know they're to some extent harmonized with, with the national park, like opening days and things of that sort. And there we know that we have fly fishing only on both Medicine Lake and on the Malin River uh, with pretty specific, uh, pretty specific rules. They don't go into saying, you know, you can't fish nymphs here, but they are otherwise fairly specific. So maybe the framework does allow those kinds of things. You might have to ask the people in the who work on the park jurisdiction yeah. about how they can work these sorts of sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. So I, I I just you know I just thought about that. Yeah. No, I, that's a good comment. I mean we we don't um we don't normally like we talk to the parks we uh certainly are in communication with them quite often about fisheries and and wildlife of course but uh their specific rule set might be done differently than ours and we would have to explore that but it's certainly it's a good point and something we can look into um as we continue to uh, i'd like to raise the point things. um uh, to speak to the crow's nest river and uh your conversation about whitefish uh, the particular reach that I am familiar with over the last 25 years, uh, there is no longer any whitefish. So you don't have to worry about catch and release. They're all gone. Which, which reach is that? That would be uh, above Sarah's and uh, below the 507. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks for that feedback. Well, I think, I think the otters, uh, which... The, uh, if they couldn't catch the trout, they went to the whitefish and that pretty well cleaned it out. Uh, mind you, worm disease had a, and, and the fact that there is no uh, observable uh, regulatory uh, bodies that ever look at, uh, at the fishermen down there. So I think it got thrown under the bus uh, in the favor of the crow's nest uh, uh, basically being a Rainbow River versus the castle, the old man and so forth being cutthroat rivers. And now that the population of rainbows have declined in the Crow, the pressure on the upper uh, 
mountain rivers has increased and so those trout are disappearing too. So it's a regulatory matter which has not been dealt with. Travis, a couple of questions just quickly on that last slide you had. You referenced on it a veteran's license. Um, just for clarity, how, how are you defining veterans in that instance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what we were what what we are defining it as is uh, limited in scope to the Canadian Armed Forces veterans, okay. um, but we're not. To my knowledge, um, we're not expanding it to other types of first responders uh, like some of the other jurisdictions have. So it's really just limited to the CAF members. Okay. Um, and the second one too, is, um, with regard to regulations, could you, could you comment on the status of the negotiations with the feds about allowing Alberta to set its own regulations regarding uh, hooks and other equipment? I can. Uh, that's a very uh, good question and very insightful. <laughs> I didn't expect it, Peter, but um, we are, you know, one of the good things is, is one of our employees was a former federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans employee. And we're working, we're still working on that. We haven't got as much progress as we wanted to see on that piece, only because I think that we're just coming up against some uh, legal uh, challenges. But, you know, those are things that we, we can always overcome. But I think that the good news is I understand that there is support from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to uh, move some of those things around to allow us to have more control over certain specific parts of the Alberta Fisheries Regulation, which will then be uh, easier for us and we become more nimble and flexible in making some of the changes. Like you mentioned, a barbless hook change, right? Or yeah. like the previous question was about fly fishing only. Like some of those things might, might come out of that uh, ability to more easily regulate the fishery in Alberta through the for the, okay. the federal oh, regulation. Would that individual be sh uh, Shane? Shane, Shane Patrick. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I've got a, a quick question. Uh, any consideration of uh, closing fisheries when water temperature gets too high? Yep. You bet. We're we uh, we definitely have that on top of our mind. <clears throat> We, um, I can't speak uh, too broadly or openly about it. I, if, you were, if you were there for the January engagement, uh, and I'm not sure if you were, we introduced the topic then. And we also had a survey and we received a lot of good feedback. And uh, the feedback uh, was really, um, th there was no one, there was no method that we proposed that uh, the anglers responded to us and they said that that was the best one and they would be 100% behind it. <laughs> but what they did talk to us about was the need for a certain amount of flexibility. And I think that I'm probably getting into too many details here, but what we're striving for is to not be overly administratively burdensome to anglers, but yet still be responsive to low flow, high temperature situations uh, in all of Eastern Slopes 1, which is our main focus. And so uh, you'll, I, I anticipate without uh, any early release today, you'll, I, I can assure you that you will probably see something in the Alberta Guide to Sport Fishing Regulations that will be released April 1st, that will have that um, spelled out a bit more clearly in that document. Thank you. Great, so thanks. Um, I got about 18 more slides uh, just to keep track. I'm not sure how much time I have or if there's a time limit to, to, to the session, but if I'm going too slow, please let me know. Uh, I was just gonna ask you, Travis, if, you're, uh, if you have some time constraints that you're worried about because we can uh, limit some of the questions. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm just in my home office here, so I have all the time here. Great. Whatever, whatever pace you like is fine. We're, we're not on time constraint either. Okay, great. Good to know. So I'm just going to move into the Bow River uh, rainbow trout population assessments. Uh, Craig, Craig highlighted this quite well, although he spoke of uh, uh, the, the section of the cumulative effects running down from Bear's Paw to uh, the Carsland um, Weir. 
This is the main section I think most of you would be familiar with, sort of placements flats down that we do our Bow River assessments on or the, or the team does those Bow River assessments on. And some of you may have seen some of these slides in uh, a Southern region uh, Bow River conversation, but uh, one, of the, one of the key things here that I picked up on is that the Bow River is of course a busy fishery. It's um, the recent uh, Creel survey, angler survey highlighted how many angler hours in the summer are put onto this river. And, and we anticipate that those angler hours are going to increase as time goes on. This is starting to rival uh, or maybe exceeding at this point, the amount of pressure that we see on some of our biggest water bodies like Lesser Slave Lake up in the, up in the north. Um, and so it's a very significant fishery and it definitely warrants the type of uh, management approach and uh, acuity that we're providing to this uh, as we continue to move forward. This, there's been a study out of the University of Calgary, and uh, it's, been, it's been worked on with our fisheries uh, biologists and, and scientists as well, that's really showed that the Bow River uh, has a rainbow trout population decline between 2003 and 2013. You can see, uh, you can see the line on the chart there in front of you. However, you know, it, it appears to be a bit of an uptick uh, near the end. But I wanted to uh, indicate that all sizes of uh, fish classes were present, including juveniles, which has been a really positive uh, event since it doesn't seem to show any uh, negative signs of whirling disease in the population. And part of our ongoing work is also through, I mentioned partnerships at the start with the Native Trout Recovery Program, but citizen science is a big piece of work we're doing uh, with the department and to supplement this, the studies that we do and the existing fish studies that have, have happened, we continue to work with members of the public uh, to scan those, uh, pit those pit tags, those passive integrated transponder tags, just to monitor the fishery and get a better understanding of, uh, of, the, of the Bow River population. And we continue to do this work and perhaps expand it in this coming year because it's been a really helpful program that helps augment uh, a lot of the work that we do. And from an interesting stuff perspective, I just wanted to share that, you know, through the information we've been collecting from anglers and the recent survey uh, of angling effort on the Bow River, we've really noticed that the catch of the fishery is really split between the shore anglers, boat anglers that are sport fishing, and then the commercial guides. It's almost like a one third split um, across the board. You know, in that year, 63,000 rainbows were caught and released. And we estimate the population in that stretch to be about 13,000 rainbows. So that really equates to a bit of a, a high cycle rate. Like that's how many fish that you would move through in a year. And based on that 2018 data, um, we figure it was uh, a cycle rate of five, but we think it might be higher today, given the increase in pressure that's happening on the Bow River. Um, the biologists and scientists in the branch tell me that back in the 80s, this cycle rate was about 1.3, so quite a bit less. And I know that the biologists feel a cycle rate between one and two is going to be stable. So what, you know, not to say we're going to make any sort of changes on the Bow River, but I know that Craig and his team are certainly watching this and, um, and considering if there's any changes that may need to be made. So we spoke a bit about the Crow's Nest River. Uh, I just want to take a moment to uh, talk briefly here. And I, uh, I think it might cover some of the things or might not uh, on the questions that were already asked. But, uh, but I, I think one, one, one person indicated that it was a real rainbow trout, you know, brown trout fishery. That's certainly uh, the case. We get a lot of feedback on that piece and it's one of our most uh, popular rainbow brown trout fisheries south of Calgary, uh, the, the, the declining rainbow trout population <clears throat> in this river, uh, unlike the bow, has likely been impacted by whirling disease. And I know that there's just been a fairly recent scientific study published, and some of you may have seen it in CJFAS, uh, that talks about that. And I have a slide on it a bit later in the presentation. I do want to say, though, that the stakeholder involvement in whirling disease education and, and the spread prevention 
has been something that uh, that continues. And again, uh, strong partners with Trout Unlimited on the Old Man chapter to help build uh, information and cleaning stations at the different access sites. And then, uh, and the 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 report, the survey that we did a couple of years ago is being analyzed. And I think I've seen some uh, initial results coming out, but it's really looking at finding that management approach for the crow's nest fishery to be able to manage it uh, in light of whirling disease and the cumulative effects that have been happening to it in the, in the environment. I, don't, uh, I know you might ask me, you know, what's that outcome gonna be? Uh, what are some of the management options you're thinking about? But we're too early in the process, uh, I, I believe at this point. I haven't heard from my experts in terms of uh, what to expect or what ideas are being discussed. But certainly when we talk about fisheries, um, it's important that we're engaging with uh, Alberta anglers. And if there is any change to the Crow's Nest River, we will definitely be talking to anglers about those. So staying in the south, but just flipping to West Slope Cutthroat Trout, uh, I just wanted to share a bit of information around the Recovery Brood Stock Development and Remote Site Incubation Program. It's an important, uh, it's an important approach to the West Slope Cutthroat Trout um, to make sure that we're developing genetically appropriate stocks of fish. Natural populations, uh, of course, in almost all situations would be the most appropriate, but most populations are at a reduced uh, rate and, and may be at risk. They're at a reduced level and may be at risk. So the development of a genetically appropriate stock housed in on one of our hatcheries will really allow us to manage the genetics and create sufficient numbers of fish for restoration and recreational stocking of this species. And this uh, last year was the first year uh, that we undertook some of this work, but we will continue it in the coming spring and uh, into the future. The images uh, around, the, uh, around the slides here really just focus on uh, the steps taken for the development of a West Slope uh, Cutthroat Trout Recovery Broodstock, which uh, I wanted to highlight that this is a new tool that's meaningful at a large scale for species recovery on landscapes. And it's a collaborative effort, of course, between several agencies, including uh, our department, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Stewardship Branch, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the Alberta Conservation Association, University of Montana, and the Montana Fish and Wildlife and Parks uh, folks. And the pure uh, West, so pure West Slope cutthroat trout are captured in their native habitat during the spawning. They're held into those enclosures until they're ready to spawn. The eggs and the milt are extracted um, by the hatchery staff, cross fertilized between different pure strain. Uh, West Slope cut trout, trout watershed populations. The fish are then reared in the hatchery from fertilized eggs to adults uh, to be parents of future recovery stock. And then in terms of the remote site incubation, the RSI, it's a recovery stocking tool or it's an approach that's being trialed uh, in former fishless water bodies. And it works by stocking eyed eggs into the buckets, into the receiving stream with the flow through water system the intent is to introduce early life history, uh, the egg to hatchling type life history portion and natural and expose it to natural selection pressures to better maximize resilience of the population and encourage the, 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 the strongest fish to survive once they are stocked. So this was the second introduction into a fishless stream section, about a thousand uh, alevins, which are of course young small trout above a barrier falls and the small targeted population stocking method for specific populations of high genetic value is what we're focusing on here for the conservation concern. But eventually the eggs from the brood stock uh, could be stocked out using this RSI uh, method. Um, I don't know if there's questions on that or if I could just keep moving on. I know that was fairly comprehensive. Sorry, I'm worried I'm not plugged into power. Um, the next slide I have is just talking about fall and rocky creeks post habitat reclamation program. So we did intensive habitat reclamation projects that took place on these creeks back in 2017 and 18. 
These projects were claimed uh, undesignated uh, off-highway vehicle trails that paralleled and crossed the creeks, introduced sediments and diverted the flow uh, back from the main channels. So the Fall Creek is the main spawning stream for bull trout in the Ram River watershed and the bull trout migrating as far away as the North Saskatchewan and Lower Clearwater Rivers to spawn. Rocky Creek is an important bull trout stream in the middle of the Clearwater River watershed. And five years post, uh, post reclamation monitoring program using the backpack electrofishing has been uh, our focus. And again, this is another one of those projects that's been uh, partnered with the Alberta Conservation Association, Trout, Un Trout Unlimited, of course, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and AEP. And early preliminary results indicate uh, that there's an increase in the bull trout numbers in both Fall and Rocky Creek. So that's very positive. Uh, I would move uh, next to the North Raven River that might be uh, of interest. Uh, so trout population estimates conducted every 10 years in this watershed since 1973. Next one is gonna be uh, held in uh, 2023. So uh, likely next year at some point in time. There's been large increase in the smaller brown trout in the 70s and early 80s. And then it's stabilized at a lower number of larger brown trout. The total trout biomass relatively stable over the last 40 years uh, in, in this system. And the riparian areas are managed collaboratively with Trout Unlimited, the Alberta Conservation Association and leaseholders. And there's been extensive riparian fencing, I think as many of you know, uh, and the challenges with maintaining that fencing have been ongoing. But the angler access points and the protection of the headwater springs continues to really uh, assist us with the management of fisheries here. And I know that the ACA just uh, a couple of years ago or so did some angling effort surveys and estimated that there's been about, that there is about 40, 4,200 or 4,300 angler hours that, uh, that are, that are placed as, as um, effort on this stream between the June, the, the June and the September, October timeframe. So that's really uh, a fairly substantial amount of effort considering that it's about 120 hours uh, for every kilometer of stream there, so. Just wanted to share some uh, updated information uh, on that and that we're planning to look at that river in the future. And then the last site specific watershed I was gonna talk about uh, or the river was the Ram. And in this case, uh, the trout population similar uh, has been conducted every 10 years. Um, and the next one again is gonna be due in, uh, in 2023. So. Another, uh, just a, another positive uh, uh, opportunity for anglers in this river system. And that's it for that section. And I'll maybe pause and see if there's any questions. Um, yeah, I actually do have, uh, you, unless I wasn't paying attention and I missed it, you didn't mention the old man. No. Uh, and no. and there I I don't know if it's just me imagining this, but there's been a significant increase in pressure there. Uh, there's a lot more guiding. Um, basically, you drive at a certain hour <clears throat> in the in the summertime, and you you count you know anywhere between fifteen and twenty five trucks parked in the gap area. And then every single access point on the stream, <clears throat> upstream from the gap, seems to have one or two or three vehicles parked. Um, so you mentioned the, you know, that there's a concern about the significant amount of uh, fishing pressure, and even if it's catch and release, that the fact that those fish might be caught and released too many times, um, I would suspect that a similar concern should arise in relation to the old man uh, potentially if it's not already a, a matter of of concern on top of all the other you know going back to the original discussion about cumulative effects all the mining that's uh, not just proposed but there's a lot of mining roads that have already been built and also on the old man, another one of those cumulative effects that has been at the back of my mind for a few years are the cows in the meadow. 
in the uh, headwaters in the beehive. Um, I don't know if anybody can do anything about those, but they just roam that that meadow there, which is it's that's literally the headwaters of the old man. I mean, there's water just seeping out of there. It's like a gigantic sponge in some sense. And those cows are just trampling happily all over the place. Um, I mean, this would be completely out of your jurisdiction, but that's just something that what we we're talking about cumulative effects and so on. I thought I should bring up the old man, some of these issues. Yeah, and no, it's just, yeah. as ahead. much of a comment as it is a sort of a question, if you if you can tell us anything or if this is on the radar in some way or anything, really, just an open question. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for the question. And I'm going to uh, I didn't get I didn't have any information on the upper old man, um, but I will turn it to Craig to see if there's any um, um, fisheries programs planned for that area. I will say though, you were right about the cattle. I, and I'm aware of the, the grazing that occurs out there. However, uh, you know, we, we are in, co in co contact with our uh, colleagues over in the lands division and the range lands program. So, you know, that is something that we continually uh, talk about and I can raise that for sure. But in terms of uh, the upper old man or the old man river, Craig, I, I'm just wondering if you have any updates as to whether or not there's gonna be some planned studies that are going to be going on there? Well, actually, well, thanks. Thanks for the question. And thanks, Travis. Um, for sure, there are the old man has been uh, part of our, especially in the headwaters, the old man's an interesting system, you know, as it moves from headwaters to downstream native trout to introduced uh, rain, like rainbows in the lower, lower brown trout in the lower portion. In the headwaters, it has been a, a priority stream. And we certainly could have added a, a series of slides on the old man. So it's a great Great question. We we've noticed anecdotally uh, changes in um, angling effort, and and like you, when I drive out there looking for a spot to fish, there's a lot of uh, I encounter a lot of anglers. Uh, I don't know off the top exactly where we're at in the in the study, but I know the ACA and and we participated with the Alberta Conservation Association in in some of the electrofishing, but they're doing the bulk of the work there to. Uh, to monitor the population. So it is more than just on our radar screen. We're, we're doing work to understand um, the status of the fish populations up there. And the, the data or the, the images that Travis showed with respect to the remote street inside incubation, all of that work was done in the upper old man, everything above the gaps, uh, or all of those fish were collected in streams up there. So it is a priority piece of watershed for us. We are doing the work. I just don't have the data in front of me to, to be able to describe what we've learned, but uh, that certainly could be part of another presentation. Thank you. That's that's helpful. I mean, that's uh, it's to me, that's one of the jewels in the background. I agree with you. I was wondering with the cutthroat uh, broodstock, do you collect DNA samples at the same time to know what kind of population you're dealing with? And uh, second part, uh, I don't know much about cutthroat. Are they like grailing with different refugia populations in Alberta um, with different DNA um, backgrounds? You want me to take that, Travis? Yeah, I was gonna turn it to you. I know you've done a lot of work on the cutthroat population down south there, so. So, um... Maybe I'll answer the second question first. Yeah, they um, uh, certainly we we see a cutthroat trout, a cutthroat trout. Um, you know, they they're they're not in they're in the sort of the headwater reaches of their former range, um, often isolated above waterfalls. They are certainly the same subspecies, but there may be some genetic local adaptation or genetic differences between between those populations. Um, you know, at the scale of the species, they are still all West Slope cutthroat trout. So, um, but we do suspect there are those local adaptations occurring in some places. Um, with respect to your first question, uh, yes, absolutely. We take, um, we take genetic information from each of the parents and we're keeping right, at least in the beginning, uh, track of 
which parents are crossed with the others. And so we, um, in fact, are have going through a process now to identify that there are some, uh, some um, very few uh, rainbow trout genes in some of those fish that are not going to be included. So the we're, we're very confident that the fish are remaining in the broodstock are 100% pure, not, um, not near pure. So yeah, no, absolutely. We're keeping very close tabs on that. And that's some of the work Travis talked about in partnership with the University of Montana. They're, we're using the same lab as all of the uh, jurisdictions that are working on West Slope cutthroat trout to understand genetics. So that's a really critical component. Really, really great question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. And, and you know, as I'm thinking now, uh, I was probably a bit remiss. Um, now that we're talking about West Slope cutthroat trout and stocking and hatcheries, uh, you know, earlier in my presentation, I talked about the walleye uh, spawn camps that we did up at Lac St. Anne this past year. And, uh, and I just wanted to share that those, those uh, walleye that we're putting into the reservoirs are actually, um, uh, are triploided. So we've got a new triploid machine that, we're, that we were testing and running out at the spawn camp to actually make sure that the, the progeny of those fish that we collected were triploid, that we're stocking out into the, uh, into the reservoirs. So that just reminded me of that. And I was glad to maybe update you on that in case I wasn't clear earlier. So I'll pivot now to the uh, I'll pivot now to the uh, whirling disease aquatic invasive species pro, um, piece. There's not many slides here. What I wanted to just highlight is that um, we continue to uh, implement our watercraft monitoring at a number of stations, both stationary and roving um, in in Alberta, primarily looking at our southern and eastern uh, borders. Uh, we did intercept 22 muscle fowl boats last year, and, uh, and that continues to be a concern. Um, we have the DOG program, and we have a lot of experts and decontamination centers in place, so it continues to be one of our main intercepting uh, programs to ensure that we don't get this invasive muscle in Alberta waters. We also continue to run a herbicide program with Diquat on Lake Isle, which is just outside Edmonton here, focusing on reducing the flowering rush uh, infestation that would potentially impact the Lac St. Anne and waters downstream. And I would say that we had a very aggressive and fast moving, oh, I'm sorry, aggressive and fast moving response to what we call the moss ball incident where you might have heard the importation of moss balls for aquariums uh, were infested with uh, mussels and we quickly um, you know stopped all of the sale of those at the pet stores and definitely contained that program before it got out of control so good work for the aquatic invasive species monitoring team we continue to monitoring for whirling disease Albeit it's rolled up into a bit more of our wildlife and fisheries health program. And, and part of the moss ball incident was taking a um, after action review of what happened and working with our partners, uh, including Saskatchewan and Manitoba, who also uh, were, we were coordinating with as long as well as the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to make sure that we uh, have a good lessons learned from that incident so that we can avoid something similar into the future. Alberta continues to co-chair and lead the National Aquatic and Basic Steering, uh, Steering Committee, the NASC, at the, at the Canadian Council of Fisheries and Aquaculture Ministers, which is a, a huge and important leadership role for Alberta, because if, if we're not there talking about mussels and some of the invasive species in Alberta, it ends up, the conversation just ends up being um, you know, different types of species like green crab or other types or tunicates out on the East Coast. So it's important that we have some internal to Canada conversations about the aquatic base of species. And last, uh, I mentioned our flowering rush control program. We're preparing for uh, the 2022 watercraft inspection at uh, a variety of locations. And, uh, and as part of the, the federal provincial territorial work on the NASC, 
we're going to start to really focus on the e-commerce and the risk of pathway for uh, aquatic invasive species and see if we can't maybe uh, contain that in the coming in the coming years. So for whirling disease, we continue to uh, uh, implement the main part of our program, which is monitoring, doing the diagnostics, uh, focusing on the decontamination, uh, managing and testing our aquaculture systems, both provincial and at times uh, private, and then education and outreach, which I think you're very familiar with in terms of trying to reach out to um, many anglers so that we're not uh, inadvertently spreading this disease from stream to stream. And in speaking of the Crow's Nest River and the article that I mentioned, that there was the article around whirling disease and an emerging threat to wild salmonids. And I would just like to read this statement that came from my whirling disease team, which, which indicates that the management of the disease and the crow really aligns with the existing fisheries management initiatives. And it's grounded, uh, it will be aligned, sorry, and it is grounded in science-based decision-making with the goal of providing long-term solution for a sustained recreational fishery. And we're trying to make sure that we balance the ecosystem health and socioeconomic drivers. So there's a lot going on here, and I think it's still in a learning phase, but working with uh, Barry Nearing from the States has been a real help to our program. And it's it's been a real eye-opener on what we're learning. And in fact, there's people on this call that might know more about whirling disease and the impacts it's having on our fishery than, than perhaps I would. So I would welcome any feedback or comments. And, and I'll just really close off uh, my presentation tonight. We had some stakeholder engagements held in January. I'm hoping you were able to participate. They were in an online webinar format and I realized that that's not the best way, but it was the way that we were trying to still communicate with anglers during the COVID pandemic. You know, with the lifting of the restrictions in Alberta, I'm hopeful to get back to more face-to-face, in-person conversations. Um, however, the, the following engagements, you know, I mentioned talked about a number of the regulation changes that we're focusing on, uh, but I really wanted to highlight, and, and I know Peter Little was there back at the Alberta Fisheries Management Roundtable days, but I really want to highlight that we're also looking at investigating the opportunity of reestablishing a provincial level fisheries advisory council. I'm looking at finalizing a terms of reference for that council and uh, getting that approved within the department so that we can start to again have conversations at a provincial level on our fisheries management program, our fisheries regulations, our fisheries management policies, and, um, and really build in the expertise from the anglers and the inputs from anglers uh, as we continue to develop our fisheries going forward. So. I'm hopeful that that, uh, that advisory council will be something that we can get uh, lifted off the ground this coming year and start to have those conversations in a meaningful way. And that's it for my presentation tonight. Um, I just wanted to thank, I, I, I'm welcome to stay for questions and I'm hoping Craig is as well, but I wanted to thank you all for your attention and, uh, and for inviting me to tonight's session. So really appreciate your time. Travis, is there was there any uh, uh, thing done about the licensing of guides? Was any decisions made or anything concrete this year? On on the licensing of guides? Yes. Yeah. So um, what we're doing this year is we're going to be um, taking a bit of time to um, first off. Uh, find out who are, who are guiding, uh, who's guiding fish in Alberta. I don't think we have a good handle on that because it was an unregulated, um, it was an unregulated activity. Second, we're gonna be looking at uh, meeting with all of them, seeing if we can't come up with some good ideas around, if we were to implement a guide license program, what would it look like? What would the terms and conditions of the license be? Who would be eligible? How would you, how would you organize? And then third, what types of uh, sub subsequent changes would we need to make in our uh, provincial regulations to help support the development of that program? I will know that we've been in contact with the guides around the Bow River who have been very positive with us around wanting to see a change. And I know that uh, I also hear a lot about uh, folks in, in, this, in the far Southwest corner of the province who see 
BC guides bringing clients over into Alberta and spending time fishing on our waters. So that's all part and parcel of our fishing guide review program. And, uh, and I expect to have some, some results hopefully this, either later this spring or this summer. So changes wouldn't be coming for another year at least? Yeah, there, there would be no regulation of guides uh, this year, I don't think. It, it, we might have something changed in the fall, but it would probably take effect next fishing season. Okay, thank you. On, on, on the whirling disease, um, is there something where we could, um, I mean, part, part of the issue is, you know, people, um, people travel a lot, right? And um, I guess Travis fell off the meeting. Carry on, Florian, he's still there. Oh, okay. Um, the, um, you know, you, you can, if, if you go to a country like New Zealand, um, they'll ask you if you're bringing in any, you know, fishing tackle with you and if you say yes, then they'll carefully look at you and make sure that, you know, your, your equipment is clean, dry, etc. Is, is there any, anything that can be kicked up to the federal level. Uh, the CBSA, I guess, would be the agency to to do something about this, even if only at the you know minimal level. But I think at this point, anybody can come in the country with equipment that's wet and dirty and jump from the car into the stream or from the plane into the stream, and there's no there's no control on anything as far as I know. I mean, I guess there's a big issue about bringing in a, an apple in your pocket, but wet waiters are okay. Is, is that something that we could, you know, like even if it comes from the province uh, could be kicked sort of to the federal level and, and say, hey, we got a big problem here. And um, this is, you know, I don't know how bad it is in other provinces, but um ultimately this this is a small small part of the puzzle after all we didn't have it for a for a long number of years and then at some point people crossing the border must have brought it in because it wasn't just migratory birds i don't think so i think we did lose travis there for uh for a moment it looks like he's back um craig maybe uh could you chime in on that answer You know, and I, 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 I would if I could, but actually, I don't know if I have the answer to that. Okay, thanks. That unfortunately, it might be, might be a Travis. Yeah, I'm sorry, my. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, go. my my laptop ran out of power. I thought I was plugged in, but I wasn't. Um, just shut everything down. Uh, but I think the question was about whirling disease, maybe, and the introduction of whirling disease into Alberta and how it how it landed here. No, my question was more about uh, the extent to which we can we can limit further damage by by trying to to get the uh, the border agency uh, federally to um, you know add this to the list of concerns for people traveling into the country, right? Because right now you can't bring a sausage, a piece of cheese, and an apple but wet muddy yeah. waders are no concern. Yeah, so uh, do you know if that's the case for sure? I'm just, I mean, I'm gonna go back and take that back to my, um, to my uh, staff that deal with the, the, the Canadian Border Services uh, authorities, the CBSA, and just make sure, but you're right. Like, I think that we promote, um, certainly we promote at the, um, uh, at the at the borders, the whole clean, drain, dry program that we have running, and uh, I'll just let me let me verify that. I'll need to verify that and just make sure that that's uh, part of that program, so that the border authorities seeing someone with waders or something coming back from fishing down in Montana or somewhere else 
is flagged for just maybe even getting that message or that awareness, not necessarily, you know, taking their their stuff like their waiters or their waiting boots or anything like that, but making sure that they're equipped with the with the messages around the risk of whirling disease coming into Alberta. Well, I mean, I mean, we used to have the big signs. I don't know if you remember those big signs. The question on the or add, right, or even just add that to the list of questions that are being the, asked yeah. of people entering. Okay. Yeah. yeah, let me follow up on that. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're running, uh, starting to run out of questions here. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, thank Travis and Craig tonight very much for coming out and spending some time uh, with us. It's, uh, it's a part of their uh, engagement process, and uh, we really appreciate being involved in that. I'd like to actually uh, mention a couple of projects that are, uh, that are tied in with some of the things that you were talking about. We've got uh, uh, four projects um, uh, that we've uh, submitted for ourselves for Alberta Conservation Association this year, and uh, we're working on one other one as well, uh, or, or we, we hope to be working on it as a partner on another one. Uh, those projects are the uh, some fencing on the Dog Pound Creek and North Raven River, so uh, riparian fencing in, in conjunction with ACA. Uh, you're aware of the Arctic Grayling uh, conservation projects in the Upper Pembina, uh, so we'll be extending our temperature monitoring for the, I think it's the 12th year this year, and uh, some other activities and a major component that we're looking at this year is some uh, eDNA work to uh, um, prove the existence of uh, fish in various streams in the Upper Pembina. Uh, we've proposed a, uh, a project, I'm not sure if it's similar to the one in Calgary uh, with the pit tag reading and so on, but we have a project that's uh, evaluating the range of, uh, of uh, walleye within the North Saskatchewan River uh, using pit tag technology as well. So we've got uh, a proposal to do some of that work. And uh, we're a partner on a submission for a research project that's looking at uh, confirming different lineages of Arctic grayling within the province. So if, uh, if everything all comes through on that one and we can prove and identify this separate, spe uh, this separate lineage of Arctic grayling, then perhaps there'll be some room for uh, additional conservation of, of the one that's a little bit more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, some projects that uh, we've got going within our chapter. Uh, there are a number of other ones within uh, Toronto Limited Canada, but uh, this this small group here in Edmonton, those are the ones that we're spearheading. That's great. That's great. That's really exciting. I mean, I as I was uh, reflecting on the presentation I just walked through, I couldn't believe how much we're involved with Toronto Limited on a whole bunch of uh, fronts. So, and hearing those other projects, uh, that's great news. Well, thank you very much again. We really appreciate you uh, spending your time with us tonight, and. Uh, uh, some really good information. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. thanks everyone for your time. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Good. See you soon. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs>